Hello, chapter 9. <clears throat> so chapter 9 is making capital investment decision. Uh, this chapter is sort of the extension of the chapter 8. Uh, now we're going to learn how to estimate the cash flow. So for chapter 8 in capital budgeting projects, uh, most of the problem we have ha actually gives the cash flows, the given cash flows. Now this chapter, we want to calculate the estimate the cash flows uh, that will be generated by the project and make a decision. So first of all, the most important thing is we have to depreciate if the cash flow is relevant or not. If we only have to include the cash flow which is relevant, you know, relevant cash flows. This relevant cash flow also called the incremental cash flows. And this incremental cash flow is the cash flow that occurs only if the project is accepted. So when you when you have the cash flow, you have to uh, answer the question this one: Will this cash flow occur only if we accept the project? If the answer is yes, then we have to include in the analysis. If the answer is no, then we have to exclude in the analysis. If the answer is partially the part of it, then we should include that part, the proportion that occurs because of the project. So anytime you have cash flow, you have to ask this important question. Will this cash flow occur only if we accept the project? So that those are these are the common types of the cash flow we may have. The first one is called the sunk cost. The sunk cost is the cost that have accrued in the past. The cost that we spent already. The typical one is like R and D cost. Research and development. Research and development cost is usually just spent already to before we decide to make a decision. In this case, we always just uh, uh, ask a question again. Will this cash flow occur only if we accept the project? The answer is no, right? Because we always spent it. Even though we reject the project, we still have to pay for it, so we have to forget about that. So we need to exclude this sunk cost in the analysis. Now the second one is the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the cost of loss of options. So if you have two projects and if you lose options because of the other one, then that, that's the cost. And this opportunity cost occurs Again, this question, I'm sorry, only if we accept the project. If we reject this project, this opportunity cost does not occur, so have to include it. Now the third one, side effect. Side effect, there are two different types of side effect. One is the positive side effect, the other is negative side effect. So something happened, like this, such as if you work in Apple and Apple launched iPhone 7, right? So, if you, uh, and when they launched iPhone 7, the previous products such as iPhone 6, iPhone 6s, those sales will decline, right? So that's the negative side effect. Your revenue for for the existing uh, product will decline. However, there are also positive side effects such as the Apple require you, uh, you have the, the wireless headset. So if you produce a wireless headset, then the new iPhone 7 will increase the sales in the wireless headset, so, right? That's a positive side effect. Now these side effects is also only occur if you accept the project. If you not launch the new product, then there's no side effect. So it should include the two. Now the, the other three, like changing network and capital, financing costs and the taxes, basically these factors should be included if it is related to the project. So the portion uh, such as the 
if the project requires some inventory aside, then that should be included as a change in net working capital. If the project requires some financing options, like borrowing more money, then the cost for interest should be included in the analysis. Taxes is also the same. So these parts probably the part no. When you do the capital budgeting project, we have to use the pro forma accounting statements, heavily income statements. And this is very similar to the way to compute the cash flow from asset that we we'll learn in chapter two, right? There are three factors. First, operating cash flow. The second, net capital spending. Third, change in net working capital. So to, to get the free cash flow, the cash flow generated by the project, we need to compute these factors and, and get the cash flows. The first one is the operating cash flows. To, to get the operating cash flow, we have to build the income statement, right? So from revenues, there is cost, right? And the depreciation. We have EBIT, right? Earnings before interest and taxes. There's interest expense. And you subtract that, then you get a taxable income. It's also called the uh, EBT. Earnings before taxes. And then minus taxes, you have net income, right? So your operating cash flow is EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes, right? That we learned in chapter two. So now suppose we don't have any external financing, so no additional financing, additional financing. It means that we don't have any interest cost, right? So same the revenue cost the depreciation you got an EBT now if we don't have any additional financing then this EBT will be just the EBT the taxable income right and minus taxes will be net income and if you look at this because this is EBT the operating cash flow when there's no additional financing will be now EBT minus taxes plus depreciation, right? And this is EBT, right? The EBT minus taxes is simply the net income, so net income plus depreciation. So if there's no external financing, like additional financing, and to so that we don't have any interest expense, then the operating cash flow is simply the net income plus depreciation. And the most of the problem in chapter seven assumes that we don't require the financing, the additional financing. So many cases we use this one, that income plus depreciation. Now there's issue about depreciation. So the depreciation expense used for capital budgeting, even though this is in a cash item, non-cash item, because because it changed taxes, the amount of taxes. If you have more depreciation expense, then it means that you can decrease the tax because the taxable income decreases, right? So the depreciation schedule that we have to use in capital budgeting project is the one required by the internal revenue service for tax purpose. So tax accounting purpose. So the amount of the depreciation the, the saving tax for from the depreciation is called a depreciation tax shield is simply the depreciation times the marginal tax rate. So there are a couple different ways to depreciate. The one is the straight line method, the other is MACRS. So the straight line method is pretty simple. The depreciation is the initial cost minus the salvage value, that's the, that's the final value, divided by number of years. But the problem is, very few assets are depreciated straight line method. 
not many uh, so probably just the I don't think any of the assets in practice will use this straight line method for the tax purpose because IRS provides the schedule of the depreciation called the MACRS. So first of all, we need to know which asset class is appropriate for tax purpose. There's a number of different ways. I showed the three different class, three years, five years, seven years. And this rate is all given. So you don't have to worry about the computation of the rate. Rate is given. And this rate is basically based uh, is used when you compute the amount of depreciation. You simply multiply percentage, this percentage given in the table by the initial cost, always just initial cost. If you, so some of this rate, it will be 100% all the time. Okay, so it depreciates to zero. And we usually use MACRS for, for the pose of the task. Now the next one is change in net working capital. So change in net working capital is about the, the current asset and liability. For capital budget proposed, we have annual needs. So annually, like each year, you need some net working capital aside. So that's the negative factor of the cash flow actually, right? the means you pay for it and then mostly it is recovered in the next year so annual recovery the same as the annual needs in the previous year and then only in final year the last year there is called the final year recovery so when project is closed, then you have to recover everything for the current asset and current liability. It's actually the same as the annual needs in the final year. So why do we have to consider the change in that working capital separately? You know, U.S. GAAP required you, your sales, so like operating cash flow, recorded on the income statement when it is made, when it is contract. Doesn't matter whether you receive cash or not. So if, even though you receive cash later on, you already recorded the sales. Same as the COGS, cost of goods sold. GAP also required to record the corresponding COGS when the sales is made. Meaning that you actually it doesn't matter you actually pay for it or not. So there's some gap about the cash, cash collection and cash payment, you know. We have to cover those cash flows too. Finally, there's inventory issue. You have to acquire some inventory and hold it. And then in final year, so when you shut down the project, everything should be cleared, right? So inventory should be sold, everything, and also the cash cycle should be closed. That's why we also re uh, require you to recover everything until the final year. Now this is the change in net working capital example. So the project required the company set aside initial net working capital, $20,000. So initial needs is twenty thousand, and then also need twenty thousand each each year, subsequent years for six years life. So twenty thousand, twenty thousand, twenty thousand for six years. Okay. Then it will be recovered. Actually, all the payment, right? So it's negative. It's recovered the next year, so this one recovered one, number year one recovered year two, two recovered year three, and three one recover year four, five and six. And the final one is left, right? And it's recovered in and uh, when you shut down the project. If they add them up, then that's the net working capital changes each year. So first year negative twenty thousand. 
zero 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 for five years and then they have hundred twenty thousand and if we add them up at this that working capital this should be zero some of them because it all it should be recovered everything by the end of the project so that's how to compute the change in that working capital now finally there is a net capital spending so there's a two fixed asset investments one initial capital investment when you acquire the, the fixed assets so initial year so year zero the big capital expenditure usually the price including the shipping and installations you know delivery things like that so that's will be the same as the initial cost of the equipment initial cost of the fixed asset now in final year so when you shut down the project basically you have to sell it sell the equipment right sell the fix all the fixed assets which and the 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 amount of the money the value the market value of that equipment is called the salvage value the problem is if the salvage value is different to the book value which is the value in the accounting statement balance sheet then there's a tax effect so you can compute the book value is the initial cost minus accumulate depreciation in final year and then if salary value different to book value then you have only a gain or loss if you have gain then you have to record this gain as income so tax will increase if you have loss then you have to include record this one as a loss in your income statement that tax is reduced and then the tax is the tax rate times this gain or loss so after tax salary values the salary value minus your taxes that's the final year cash flows for the net capital spending so really depends on how you depreciate actually the assets so we have number of examples actually in the next uh, slide this one will be solved in class so next class we meet we're gonna solve these problems